if, if you look at the historical record as I understand it, uh, the involvement from the sending of boatmen uh, to the Egyptian campaign, the Sudan, in the 1890s, to the Boer War, World War I, and in many ways World War II, and certainly in the interwar period, uh, the Canadian government of the, of the days were very reluctant to commit. But domestically, politically, there were political forces at play because of the nature of the demographics in Canada, which made the government very perceive that they were unable not to commit themselves. So both in terms of the Sudan campaign, the Boer War, and again, we were repeated again in Korea, the government called for volunteers to avoid an actual, now of course, the political situation of the Canadian government in, at the turn of the century, in 1900, in the Boer War, and Korea is different because we're not formally independent, we're still tied to the, the British Empire, and we don't have uh, control over our foreign and defense policy, per se. But you see that remarkable cons consistency. Uh, even in World War II, when the government thought saw that events were occurring that would lead to the outbreak of war. We took a week between September 3rd and September 10th before we declared war. From what I've read in, in the materials in the archives and accounts of it, the government was, was itself was questionable about why should it engage in another British war, uh, but recognized that the nature of the political public support in Canada, the English Canadians, would demand Canadian involvement. And what you saw, of course, in World War I, in World War II in particular, was this attempt to avoid a repeat of the slaughters of Canadian forces in the first war by deploying forces, by doing things which would reduce the problem of casualties, which would reduce the demands on personal resources in Canada, which would reduce the demands of conscription, which could threaten domestic security. So generally, Canadian governments have been reluctant to deploy overseas for domestic political reasons, which in turn have driven them to deploy overseas, but try to constrain themselves. I mean, we, we don't remember, one of the lessons we didn't learn, what we don't understand is, if you think back to World War I, Canada at the time of World War I was had a population of somewhere between seven and eight million people. Canadian, 60,000 Canadians were killed. A little less than 1% of the Canadian population was killed. There was, and I don't know the exact numbers of the time, 100, 200,000 wounded. 650,000 men participated in the war under Canadian colors. That's just under 10% of the Canadian population. That's a massive commitment on the part of a very small country. Uh, but again, driven by domestic political considerations. And I think to this day, we've seen this repeatedly, a general reluctance. Because at the end of the day for Canada, and I think mostly in Canadian society, most conflicts overseas are discretionary to us. Uh, the Taliban aren't going to show up on Canadian shores. ISIS is not coming to Canada, thank you very much. Uh, and it's the discretionary element which remains a constant, I think, in Canadian thinking. And a general degree of, I think in terms of when Canadian governments ask themselves, should we commit, the general, the, the preference is, well, why should we? What interests do we have here? What is our self-interest here? What does it matter to us? What happens in Afghanistan? What happens in the Middle East? What does it really matter at the end of the day? Economically, there's no economic interests in these regions of the world, or in Africa, or in Southeast Asia. There's no economic interests. Political interests, what do we obtain? Do we obtain political capital with Washington? Well, not really, because the relationship runs in nice, narrow stovepipes between Canada and the United States. What we do militarily with the United States, say, in Afghanistan and Syria, isn't going to affect Keystone Pipeline, it is going to affect other economic issues with the United States. Those are separate things. Governments try to link them, but they're not separate. So there's, you ask yourself, what are our interests? What are our naked self-interests to do these things?
The answer becomes, there really there, there isn't any. I think Dan Duran at the end of the day, despite ballistic missiles, despite the fact that people can hurt us, Dan Duran at the end of the day still is by and large right. We live in a lovely part of the world, pretty safe, pretty wealthy, pretty secure. It makes it difficult for Canadian governments. Um, well, I think, I think one of the things that many Canadians forget is that aid to the civil powers is a big part of what the Canadian Forces does. So when there are disasters and uh, either municipalities or provinces are overwhelmed, there's an official call that goes through the Minister of Defense and down through the chain of command. And I think that role of aid to the civil power um, needs to be thought of more carefully because it has actually a lot of what the Canadian Forces does, but it doesn't get a lot of thought in terms of resources and training. We have um, exercises, but the exercises are usually with the away game in mind. And the fact of the matter is, you know, our Department of Defense and our, our Canadian Forces, the first requirement is to defend Canada and North America second. And I think we're going to see uh, that role take on increased significance, partly because of things like climate change, um, partly because when we do have, now that we have this conflation of security and defense, where let's say there's an attack on an electrical grid. Well, that's not really a defense issue, except for that the defense has the manpower, um, it has the equipment, it has the training, and something we can throw at these situations, especially because they have unlimited liability, um, they're often taken for granted. And I think that role that they play with aid to the civil power is a very, very important one, but it's not often uh, thought about carefully. Let me just add two observations to this. Prior to World War II, the primary role of the Canadian Forces, we didn't call them the Canadian Forces then, the small Canadian Army in particular, in aid to the civil power, was, this may come as a surprise to you, to break strikes. That's what they did. They didn't like it. Military people, if you think about the reasons why do people volunteer in a professional army, which, military, which we have, why do they volunteer? Why, what do they think about? And interesting to point out, if you look at recruitment patterns, at the Afghan, when the Afghan war broke out, recruitment demand, recruitment went up like this, it just shot right up. It tells you something about the type of people, which are good, because you need those type of people. I just want to put that in the back of your mind. Navy officer many years ago, several years ago, uh, Andrew, remember, we were talking about the Arctic. He, he had gone to the Arctic with his ship and said to us, one of the reasons why the government likes the military to do things in the Arctic and help society and all these civil issues is they don't have to pay overtime. Well, I never thought of it that way. But the, the issue, it seems to me, for the future in terms of the Canadian forces domestically is when you think about the Arctic, when you think about other issues around Canada, is the question, do you want, or should we, or do we want to give the forces constabulary powers? And that's a big question which no one's asking. When you think about particularly the Arctic and the developments up there, which Andrew can speak to better than I can, uh, in terms of increased traffic, increased economic exploitation, uh, the high cost of infrastructure, the high cost of personnel up there, the forces are a natural tool the government will turn to, because they don't pay overtime, or for other reasons as well, that they can employ up there. But when you talk about efficiency and costs, do you want to then give them constabulary powers? I think that's one of the issues which have to be considered in terms of where the government and where society, what you want the forces to do. And, and just tied to that, there's you know, a wider conversation that has to go on in many countries about the militarization of police and the policization of the military. Because it was always that the military deal with defense, it's the external threat that's there in basket. 
police is always the threats at home, that's their in basket. And more and more, we're seeing sort of a, 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 a flip-flopping of roles, but we have to always make sure that they have the mandate to deal with those threats. And for the military, it means giving them officer powers. And that comes with a whole other level of training and concerns. Right now, they have officer powers. For instance, if they see somebody illegally fishing in our territorial waters, they can you know, apply some Canadian laws. But other than that, um, you know, they, they don't have the right to go and arrest people in the street for, for infractions that they see. But, but more and more, um, countries around the world are using their military for that purpose because they're sitting there, and you especially see this in South America, because you're paying for them anyways, so why don't we, while they're there, get them to do other stuff? But this runs counter to all of the theory and uh, understanding of what it means to have a professional military with civil oversight that deals with defense. And the point I made about recruitment, it alters the type of people you want. It alters recruitment. Who will volunteer? Remember, we have an all-volunteer force. Who will volunteer and who won't volunteer? And that changes, the, as Andrea said, I think the way we train, uh, the type of individuals, their education backgrounds, et cetera, et cetera, you need. It makes it a much more complicated and a bigger picture. And the military, I think, will, will argue to you that our primary role is defending Canada against military threats. If you develop a military force which more and more is more constabulary, there's only so much time in the day, training-wise. What do you lose in terms of that other part of the component that you potentially may need them for down the road? And that's a difficult trade-off, and it's a costly one. Well, that, that, I mean, that's a conversation we have to, to ask about what kind of police we want. I think so far, you know, and this is why the Canadian military is so well respected, they are very highly trained. And it's not just on the, you know, how do I shoot at a target, how do I drive a ship? Um, they still spend an incredible amount of time and energy, and often on their own time, taking things like what they call OPME courses, which are courses about making sure they understand their role as the military within the wider Canadian society. They have to write papers about this. They have to understand the Defense Act. They then have also courses um, uh, and tests on the law of war. And so far, I think they, they, they understand the difference between the constabulary role and the military role. The problem is not the military. The problem is Parliament and our, uh, our, our parliamentarians who don't understand that as well and tend to say, oh, well, we'll send the military, they can do that, without understanding their, their role, the command and control they have, um, and the officer powers they do or do not have. So, yeah, it's a wider conversation we have to have. Yeah. Let me add two points here. Uh, prior to the landings in 1944 on June 6th at Normandy, the rules of engagement for the Allied forces was basically one sentence. No action should be taken which will impede your forward advance. Those aren't the actual words, but basically that's what the soldiers were all told. Do nothing to stop your forward advance because we have to move off the beaches, inland, move forward. Today, when a Canadian soldier goes into combat operations, the rules of engagement, and I'm being a bit facetious, is probably a book you need a much better educated uh, soldier, sailor, and airman to be able to understand the nuances of these gray areas. And that's changed the way. But the second point I want to raise, if you ask the military about policing and these types of things, they don't want to do it. They are being pulled in for political reasons at the governmental level very reluctantly. Uh, there was an article written long ago by Jack Granitstein, one of the, probably the most distinguished military historians, and it was on dom domestic roles of Canada's armed forces, and he titled this, No More Onerous a Duty. And the point he was trying to make is this is something the forces don't want to do, but are 
for a variety of reasons, economic reasons, social, political reasons, are being pulled into this, and then you get to the points that Andrea has raised about then, you know, what what do you do? How, how do you train soldiers? What are the costs and benefits? 